we're going to be talking about the uh, you know solutions for taking bitcoins in your business and um, you know we'll be talk taking questions as to you know, maybe some challenges we've got uh, our panel of experts up here I'm going to go through and introduce everybody this is Pierre uh, Pierre help me out with the, the last name I know I'm going to get it wrong Pierre Noiza no <laughs> you heard him <laughs> <laughs> Pierre handles uh, uh, Bitcoin Central, Paymium, which uh, is the overall brand for Bitcoin Central and uh, BitJunior. We've got uh, David Johnston, CEO of Engine Inc. And um, real quick, what does uh, Engine Inc. do? Uh, basically, it's a personal search engine. Let's users aggregate all their personal email accounts and search them. So we accept Bitcoin for our uh, software as a service model. Awesome. Great, and uh, Stephen Pear from, uh, from CTO of BitPay. Um, tell people real quick what BitPay does. Uh, BitPay is a merchant processor. Yeah, take, uh, help, helps merchants take Bitcoins. That's right. Yeah, it's gotta be, the, gotta be a big name in that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's Christian Dumontet. Dumonte. Yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> and Foodler, uh, I mean, I don't know what Foodler does, so please uh, enlighten us for a moment. Sure, Foodler is an online ordering service, uh, basically a restaurant aggregator. Uh, should you want to order food for delivery from a restaurant, uh, you might use Foodler. Excellent. And so, like lots of different restaurants you can use Foodler? Sure. Yeah, we're up to over 12,000 restaurants now in the U.S. Awesome. That's a, and, and, and people can use Bit Bitcoins to buy from 12,000 restaurants? As of uh, one month ago, yes. Yeah, yeah, I saw the news. It was really mm -hmm. exciting. So, um, it, it, you've got to have people that come to you on a pretty regular basis, uh, Pierre, and say, you know, I've got a business. And, um, you know, I want to take Bitcoins, but I'm confused. I don't know anything about them. How do you generally handle that? Um, I'd say in Europe, uh, Bitcoin uh, awareness about Bitcoin is maybe not as, as high as here. So the merchants in Europe are very conservative. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had talks with the merchants, a large retail chain, for instance, uh, until uh, very recently. And then the, uh, the crash in the <laughs> exchange rate uh, happened in April. And, and that uh, caused, this, caused this merchant to uh, pull the plug on this project for the time being, just because they, they couldn't deal with the volatility, or they were afraid of the volatility of the rate. Uh, it's not so much the people we were dealing with directly, but the, uh, the, the, their hierarchy, I mean, the, the organization. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough self in a large retail organization sure. today. Uh, so, and for small merchants, it's not our core business because Bitcoin Central is uh, mostly a Bitcoin exchange, mm -hmm. so it's mostly individuals uh, and, and not so much, uh, for at least in the Eurozone, which we serve, uh, it's not so much merchants yet. David, when the, uh, the big rise happened, what was it, I mm -hmm. don't know, three weeks ago? And, uh, sure. And, you know, people, that was it, much doom was predicted for Bitcoin, this is it. What would you, you think in your business? I mean, you're like, I'm selling everything. <laughs> well, I'm very bullish on the, the long term of Bitcoin, so I didn't really have any uh, personal concerns. And, you know, for me, the interesting thing working in the technology startup space is dealing with companies that are looking for first adopters. Mm -hmm. That's part of a lot of the fun I've had in the last few months in Austin is getting technology startups to start using Bitcoin. Because if you're looking for an early adopter demographic, mm -hmm. this is probably four or five million of the most cutting edge early adopters in the world. And, and in so, the technology field, we're talking males, right? right. Exactly. <laughs> and so that can be a very easy sell. And really what's making it even easier is services like BitPay, mm -hmm. uh, like Coinbase, where I can just connect an API they can handle the back end. And I literally, in our case, we're using uh, Coinbase. I could literally set up these other companies, a Coinbase account, send it to them here, change the password. Now you have your back end covered. And my developers didn't have to recreate a subscription system or something like that. It's all taken care of for you. So software as a service and using that model in the case of Bitcoin is just going to make it infinitely easier for merchants like us to quickly implement it, right? I didn't have to put a developer on this for a month. It was a matter of a day. Stephen, um, they just pointed out uh, business owners tend to be conservative, at least in the area of uh, handling their money. Mm -hmm. But uh, the customers that want to spend Bitcoin tend to be early adopters. How do you bring these people together um, in a way that uh, doesn't freak the, uh, the, <laughs> the merchant out? Well, we, we take all of that handling of Bitcoins out of the merchant's hands. So if a merchant wants to be totally isolated from Bitcoin, they can be. They can set their prices in dollars and they can get paid out in dollars. Uh, 
And they understand that, they know how to account for that. It's really a no-brainer. And so when you look at it from that perspective, Bitcoin just becomes the payment protocol or the payment network. Um, and of course, it's a great payment network because it takes away all of the issues with chargebacks and, and so on and so forth that we, we all know about Bitcoin. Yeah, you guys' business has really been booming. I mean, it's, it's hard to <laughs> let's dance around this. I mean, the fact is BitPay is really, really, um, you know, t taken off and you've got a lot of business. And are you able to keep up? I mean, do you have to turn people away? How's that going? Uh, yeah, I think we're keeping up. Okay, we're, good. We're struggling. <laughs> it's a challenge. Well, um, the, you know, we're I'm, trying to, our, our focus now is really refining our processes, putting more capability into the hands of the merchants. Mm -hmm. um, making it so that uh, they don't have to open up support tickets to get things done, they can do it themselves. So that's, that's our challenge right now. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're keeping up. Excellent. So, um, I'm, I'm sorry, Christian, you, when, when, with, as far as taking um, Bitcoins at Foodler, did you understand Bitcoins ahead of time or how did that, how did that go? Who, and which service are you using to take them or are you doing it on your own? Sure. Well, this, he said it was a no-brainer, and yeah. I just want to know, do you got a big brain in this, or are you no-brain in it? <laughs> we don't have much of a brain. No, uh, we're, um, we're processing it ourselves. So okay. what we ended up doing is, was uh, taking the reference implementation, running it on an AWS instance, actually a micro instance. What's that? Um, the, the reference uh, software okay. implementation for Bitcoin, the Bitcoin server uh, package. And uh, using the RPC mechanism, in other words, using the interfaces it already exposes, we integrated it with our network. So, so we're doing it ourselves. How do you keep customers' orders separate from each other? You've got money coming in all the time. You've mm -hmm. got, what, 12,000 restaurants mm -hmm. potentially? Is mm -hmm. that the number? That's the number. Yeah, 12,000 restaurants mm -hmm. potentially. People can use Bitcoins from which to purchase. And there's got to be you know, several, uh, there's several payments coming in sometimes. People tend to eat at the same hours, mm -hmm. and those yes. payments can come in. Yes. How do you differentiate between this guy ordered this with mm. this money and that guy ordered that mm -hmm. with that money, and mm -hmm. she wants mm -hmm. a pizza? Sure. Well, we have an accounting system that we've written. Um, Foodler existed before. Um, Get you know, right up on the mic if sure. you have um, Well, we process m most of our transactions through Visa, MasterCard, et cetera. Okay. So we've already solved that. Yeah. Um, and that's basically an accounting system issue. So, and and a bit Bitcoin just integrates with that yeah, same system? Yeah, it's not, it's not too different than, another, than any other way of paying on Foodler. You know, you might have a Foodler gift card, you might choose to pay with cash, you might choose to pay with credit. In any case, we have to account for that. Do you find yourself uh, hoping that people pay with uh, Bitcoins? Of course. Or hoping that they, okay. Yeah. <laughs> of course, yeah. It's, it's, for us, it's, it's great. Uh, we don't have the chargeback at risk. Um, the fees are lower. And um, primarily, when you look at a low margin business as ours, 2% uh, Credit card fees are substantial for us. Mm -hmm. So, um, and these chargebacks are they a big problem in your line of particular line of work? They're not, but we do have to dedicate resources to to them. Uh, okay. When a chargeback inquiry comes in, we have to work with our restaurant partner to understand what occurred with this chargeback. You know, was the food delivered? Was it signed for, etc. So it's a time drain. Um, here, um, as, as far as helping businesses, you're 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 you're, you're aiming at the larger ones. Um, how is it that in, um, how is it that you're targeting these larger businesses and um, you know bringing them in? Well, the, the first challenge we have today is uh, to have a, uh, a working uh, marketplace in euro, uh, meaning uh, uh, liquidity uh, to uh, isolate the merchants, as uh, Stephen uh, alluded to. Uh, we need to isolate the mer merchants from the volatility risk. So that means uh, they, they, they need to cash out in, in euros uh, uh, instantly if they want to. Uh, and that takes uh, a very uh, efficient uh, trading mechanism for, for euros. That to, to my knowledge, to my, in my experience, doesn't exist yet. So that's what we are building for the, for the time being. What we are building is a, a marketplace, possibly connected to other marketplaces in Europe where, where we can uh, uh, operate uh, safely, I'd say. That means uh, in a regulated fashion. That means uh, a banking partner that's licensed or being licensed ourselves. Uh, we've been the first uh, exchange, I, I believe, uh, in the world to be uh, uh, associated with a, a payment institution. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were regulated. Uh, then the uh, partnership has ended uh, last month for several reasons, one of them being the, the volatility that uh, scared them a little. The other was internal reasons uh, for them because they were, they, they are, their ownership structure changed. Uh, so now we are looking for a new banking partner. But that shows how difficult it is to develop um, a, a working exchange for, for the currency, the fiat currency, because most large merchants will uh, want to cash out in fiat currency. Immediately, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine 
that's true. Um, if there's any questions from the audience, I'd uh, love to take them. Our panel will be um, happy to, to handle your questions as far as uh, challenges you might be having in your business and accepting Bitcoins, that kind of thing. And I'm sure we'll handle general questions, but this is the, you know, that's the specifics of this. So just uh, step up to the microphone and, and uh, you try to get my attention. And when you do speak into the microphone, make sure you're nice and close to it, because uh, that's how these mics are designed. So, um, David, as far as um, you know, uh, taking bitcoins, do you do you find your customers are you know reticent to the idea? What what, what do you what are the reactions as far as um, you know people taking them? I mean, do you, have, when you when you present this, it has to be kind of interesting. I was talking to some folks in the uh, the elevator up here and trying to explain bitcoins, and one lady got it right away, and the other lady just has no clue what I'm talking <laughs> about. <laughs> Well, I don't know necessarily if the merchant is where you want to do the conversion. Mm -hmm. So previous to this, we were integrated with Stripe. So we're taking credit cards, you know, directly on the website. Um, and now, you know, Bitcoin is an option. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the people paying us in Bitcoin are already in the Bitcoin community, and they're interested in the service that we're providing. So for us, I would really advise if merchants are interested in accepting Bitcoin, go tap into the existing Bitcoin community. I mean, there are a huge number of Bitcoiners on the Reddit sub-community. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's up past 40,000 now. Of course, there's a lot of people on the Bitcoin forums. That's where you should be posting and saying, hey, we're now accepting Bitcoin for X, you know, come and check it out. And that has been, you know, a great response because people in the Bitcoin community obviously want the utility of their Bitcoins to increase and every additional merchant that starts accepting Bitcoin for whatever service now can fill a new need for that person that's already into Bitcoin. So that's, that's sort of been our approach. You know, I've been on the Bitcoin sub forum for a long time, contributing uh, comments and thoughts. And, you know, we'll be making another announcement around that with, with Coinbase. Now, I think we were the first company to use their subscription API that they just released a couple of days ago. Before that, it was single payments. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but yeah, I think if anybody in this room is a merchant, I would just, you know, recommend that you get involved in the online communities make an announcements there, and that's really where you can drive people that already have it. But it does raise awareness for those that don't know about Bitcoin now that it's a payment option, right? right? And the more of that we have, the better. Um, Stephen, you see, you see the purchases that go through. I mean, you know, you, you know who's buying with Bitcoin and, and you know, where they're buying with Bitcoin. Is it trickling in for most businesses? Or are there some businesses where it's just Bitcoin payments are pouring in for this, uh, this particular business? I mean, where, uh, are we seeing overall just sort of trickles that, that are turning to floods? Or are there some of them, are they coming from particular areas? And Actually, um, we don't necessarily know who the buyer is. Oh, really? Okay. A merchant can set up their, their service with us so that we, BitPay actually does not see any buyer information on that invoice. Um, a lot of merchants, though, do provide some type of information about the buyer because it helps us uh, process refunds and, and, and do some of the things that we need to do. Um, there are merchants that are processing, you know, uh, 50, 100 transactions a day, and there are others that do one a month, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Um, so it, it, it runs the gamut. Do you find the merchants are coming just because they want more business? They're, they're, they've heard about this Bitcoin thing and, you know, we need to be, I guess, guess we need to provide more services for our customers. Yeah, there, there's a, a lot of marketing value to uh, announcing that you're accepting Bitcoin. So a, a lot of them do, do it for that purpose. Um, many of them do it because they w are supportive of Bitcoin and they want to, this is a good way for them to accumulate Bitcoin, actually. Mm -hmm. So they can take so, a small part of their... Uh, transactions uh, in, in Bitcoin. And, some of, and for some of them, Bitcoins represent a tiny percentage of their overall sales. Right. So they'll just take everything in Bitcoins. So they just hold it, is that what you're saying? Take everything um, well, I don't Bitcoins. know what they do with it okay. after they get it, but... but <laughs> <laughs> oh, so they take, I see, they get BitPay will out. pay them out in, in Bitcoins instead of converting to dollars. And, um, I mean, that's the really one of the great things about BitPay is that, mm -hmm. you know, immediately you can have your yeah. U.S. dollars, so you can tell a merchant, look, you know, right. lower fees for, uh, you know, than Visa and MasterCard, no chargebacks, and you can, you know, cash out into... Right. The some, some of them will actually take the difference in our fees and, and what they were paying with credit cards and do that in Bitcoins. Okay. And so for them, it, it looks like they're paying the same as they always did with the credit cards, except they're also getting these extra Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. 
So, so um, you know, when, when you did, as far as Foodler, I mean, you're doing 12,000 different uh, folks. I mean, is there, is it, is a lot of people buying in mm -hmm. Bitcoins? Is it, uh, you know, just a few? I mean, how's it going? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, we, see, we saw it start in San Francisco, actually. And mm -hmm. so right now, the, uh, the, con the largest concentration of Bitcoin, Bitcoin paying customers is here. Oh, really? Um, it's followed by DC. Um, and uh, in terms of the volume, well, it's still very small, but it is a group of early adopters, uh, influential early adopters. And, um, you know, I see it as, as if we've entered a new market. Well, we start at zero and we work up from there. So week by week, it increases. Does Foodler handle the delivery aspect? I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Uh, no, clear. we don't. We are, we are a, um, an online service. Okay. So we either work with a delivery service mm -hmm. or we'll use the restaurant's delivery services themselves. And so they, uh, they, they just pop right back in. I think we have a question. What's that? Oh, oh didn't see him. Hey. Yeah, I just had a question. I'm a product developer, and I accept Bitcoin. But my big thing is, how do I get manufacturers, say, in China to accept Bitcoin? Because I, I think that would be huge. There's so many fees and the different currency exchanges. And also, how do I get distributors that want to buy my product to pay me in Bitcoin? I can. Um, so one of the things we're finding at, at Bitcoin or at BitPay is a lot of merchants are asking that very same question. Um, and so we implemented a billing feature so that uh, merchants can actually have their vendors bill them through our system and they can keep a lot of their, the merchants can keep a lot of their receivables in Bitcoin and use that to pay their vendors. So we're trying to work up the supply chain. Have you uh, discussed any of this with, uh, with any of the, I mean, it, it's kind of like a, I don't know, a, it's, a, it's a conversion uh, yeah, conversation. Yeah, that's tough because at first when you talk to people about it, you know, it kind of sounds like a scam. You're like, oh, some online <laughs> currency. So that's kind of like, how do you overcome that? How do you tell them what the benefits are? Yeah, I should add that um, keep in mind that the vendor can have everything converted back into whatever currency they're most yeah. familiar with and comfortable with. Well, if I could uh, chime in, yeah, I sure. thought it was really interesting uh, just a few weeks ago uh, that CCTV uh, aired a 30-minute documentary on Bitcoin. And I would use that as an educational tool because in China, with the way the regulatory environment around speech yeah. works, it's sort of an implied sort of this is okay that they would put it on CCTV, or at least that's what I've heard from people that live in China. So that may be a great educational tool to get them to say, okay, this is something that's all right to deal with. And like, like you're saying, I mean, just they can take the currency risk out if they want. And yeah. uh, from there, it should be a pretty easy sale. If they want your money, tell them it's got to be in Bitcoin, <laughs> and they'll take Bitcoin. Cool. As long as you can address those core issues, right? So yeah. governance and conversion. Right. Yeah, I think it just comes down to, to options and variables and, and growth. Great. Thank Thanks. you. Get right up on the mic. <laughs> so, uh, so ducktailing off of what he said, Taking it a step further, I'm looking to build a company that's 100% Bitcoin and living in the digital currency completely, paying workers, paying myself, all in, all in Bitcoin. Is there anything that you can add to how that would look? Are you um, going to be in the United States? Yes. You're going to have some challenges paying workers in Bitcoins. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone? <laughs> challenges, but I don't know necessarily if they're challenges that can't be uh, overcome. Uh, there's a lot of services I just talked to somebody here at the conference that basically is a CPA and he's building a service around allowing businesses to be able to track things, basically treat this as a foreign currency. And I mean, there's plenty of rules around how you treat foreign, c foreign currency and foreign currency income. And so if you can, it, it's going to be challenged, but if you can connect up with a company like that, that can help you with compliance, mm -hmm. yeah, you can, you can do it. It's just uh, a little more. Yeah, it's not impossible. It's just work. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> but more power to you. That's great. Yeah, thanks for doing it. I mean, that's what we need. That's what we need. I, uh, my name's Charles Evans. I teach finance at Florida Atlantic University. Um, thanks I, for coming uh, out, Charles. I, yeah, I don't mind coming out to the outer provinces from the center <laughs> of everything from time to time. Um, <clears throat> look at a map. We're in the middle of everything. Um, actually, I have a comment that uh, I wanted to make, but um, the previous questioner just alerted me to something. Uh, I teach finance at the university level. Uh, I'm a veteran of the uh, first dot-com wave in the 1990s. My wife is an accountant for more than 15 years, and we're looking to be just like that CPA that you were talking about. We actually like the fact that it's work because it keeps the riffraff out, um, so then we can have all the lovely business for ourselves. 
Um, now, what I was coming up to say in reality, though, was is there anybody here in this room who can tell me approximately how many people have um, come here for this, uh, this conference? I'd heard that there were a thousand registrations and that they were hoping for 1,500 to show okay. and I've been looking around and keeping an eye on that number and okay. I'm going to, I'd be willing to put quite a few bitcoins on a bet that there's more than 2,000. Very good. Um, the Financial Management Association is the uh, second tier professional organization for academic finance people and so every year at their annual meeting, freshly minted PhDs in finance go there for the job market and that's also where the finance people from the second tier universities go present their papers and stuff like that. They draw about 2,000 people a year. So one way of breaking through this resistance toward Bitcoin is just tell everybody that nearly 2,000 people showed up for this blasted conference. Mm -hmm. this, oh, yeah. this, this event is the answer to the question mm -hmm. or at yeah. least it's part I, of the answer to the question. I was at the uh, 2011 conference in uh, Prague, and there were 80 people in the room. So right, <laughs> that, that right. shows you the uh, right. The so, ramp up oh yeah, that thing's a scam, isn't it? Well, we got people from the federal government here for crying out loud. Yeah. Come on. This is some of the smartest people in the world are here getting scammed. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> you know, I'm running around here. I've almost got Roger Veer scammed. <laughs> Charlie Shrimps wrapped around my finger. <laughs> <laughs> Pierre, did you go to the 2012 one in London? No, I missed that one. Okay. I, I skipped. I went from Prague to uh, San Jose. <laughs> any, anyone have any idea on the numbers? 2012. I think there were 300 people in London, from what I recall. The, um, Looks like uh, Bitcoin Foundations trying to brand themselves and keep the uh, the it's a big conferences success, on themselves. Yeah. <laughs> big success. Please. Hi, hi. My name is Ramu Sinkro. Uh, from I'm I'm very new to Bitcoin the world. And uh, from my understanding, it looks like it takes time for the Bitcoin network to reconcile every transaction. Reconciling what? Reconcile every transaction. Mm -hmm. If I transfer funds to someone else, the network has to agree and all the blockchains have to be published and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So if a merchant were to accept Bitcoins, how long he or she should wait? before the transaction is completely reconciled? This is a really great question. Um, so, you know, it takes, it's, it's this is one of the as aspects of Bitcoin. It takes, you want six verifications of a transaction and exactly when is it safe to hand over that bar of gold that somebody has just purchased from you or whatever it is. Because some of these items can be very, you know, you don't want to turn on the car and drive it off the lot if it's not verified. So. Um, if it's a bar, go wait for six yeah. confirmations. Six, yeah. okay. <laughs> well, that's, that's an interesting question because, yeah, it's typically an hour, right? So 10 minutes per block, six blocks, six confirmations. Right. So it's typically an hour to get a, a full confirmation. But I'm interested in the services that are popping up around, okay, well, we can make this instant if we do a layer on top where we know this person's identity and we're doing some yeah. basic things, you know, the, money on account. There, there, there are solutions for making this instant, and I don't think those solutions are necessarily altcoins or chain No, no, there's, um, there's, services some, on top. there's something called micropayment channels that's available in the, in the core Bitcoin protocol that if wallets automatically set those up with anybody that you regularly buy from, you can do instantaneous um, fully confirmed transactions on the Bitcoin network. Right. Yeah, I think it's uh, also important to consider the potential risk profile of the transaction. Uh, the amount of computational power required to falsify a three confirmation uh, trans uh, transaction would be very difficult. So if you're dealing with several hundreds of dollars, you can fairly safely accept it after maybe two confirmations. There's nothing special about six. It's just that it's much more difficult to falsify it at that level. You're gonna, we're going to have to have you on the mic. No, on the microphone up there, if you would, please. Just to, to This is recorded to, for posterity. It's just, it's just, just to the complete detail. The answer. I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to ask you, can you repeat the name of the protocol you were referring to? Uh, okay. Micropayment channels. Yeah, I guess that's some in, inside the Bitcoin. We're, we're still ferreting out all the interesting aspects of the, uh, the Bitcoin, you know, the, the genius of Satoshi and mm -hmm. <laughs> what goes on in, inside this, uh, this Bitcoin protocol. Actually, it was discussed in the Satoshi paper, the, uh, the prime of uh, double spend after a few seconds. Typically, uh, the, the transaction message will take three seconds to propagate over the Bitcoin network. And if you wait 10 seconds, it's estimated that uh, the risk of a double spend are very limited. Uh, 
uh, it, it's getting closer to zero after 10 seconds if, if it's in sharp transactions. If it's an online transaction, there is no need, there is no need to rush and you can easily wait. <coughs> Obviously, the, uh, if, if it's not a digital good, you can easily wait 20 minutes, well, an hour. If it's in sharp transaction, after 10 seconds, the merchant is considered to be safe. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. We actually wait 15 seconds and then we uh, proceed with zero confirmation so long as it's under $500. Uh, so, and, and we have this specific challenge of having to deliver food quickly. So we right. don't have the luxury of waiting. If somebody's hungry, they want their food within an hour. Um, so, so we've had to, to work with them. Right. Yeah, is there a recorded case of somebody getting uh, you know, ripped off in, in, this, in this way? Because I just don't, I've never heard of it. And, and you know, in my business, the way I, we purchase, yeah. you know, I at any point could stop. It, you know, the, the, the purchasing operation can be weeks long. Mm. So um, you know, it's, not, it's never a concern for me. They send it, I just, and they said they send it, I don't even look. <laughs> yeah, we, have, we haven't had any problems with that. Mm -hmm. um, it could happen. You know, there's always a risk of, of fraudulent transactions. I think it's very low. Um, Does anyone know of a, a circumstance where it occurred? Mm -hmm. we had one transaction that didn't confirm, and you went but it was an accident. Hundreds of thousands of transactions, <laughs> yeah, is that right? Okay. Yeah. Um, but it was an accident, and they actually ended up redoing the payment, so yeah. it wasn't an intentional double spin. It's not impossible. I mean, it's been done before, and people have gamed Satoshi Dice through uh, zero confirmation double spins. Yeah, well, and Satoshi Dice, of course, is, yep. uh, you know, more transactions occur there than, than any There are a couple else. proposals on the table in the core Bitcoin protocol in the in the peer-to-peer -peer uh, mesh network to actually broadcast attempted <laughs> double spins, which will give uh, listeners a, an opportunity to see when there's a, an attempted double spend, um, even on zero confirmations. Uh, and I would also point out there's a really good paper that Minnie Rosenfeld wrote that analyzed the actual risk, that did a, a full risk analysis of, mm -hmm. you know, what, what kind of risk you're taking at various uh, numbers of confirmations. Mm -hmm. um, Pretty minimal. As, yeah, as I, I mean, it's, it's basically, a, it's a risk assessment. How, you know, depending on the nature of the transaction, how long should you wait uh, um, to be comfortable? I, and going out six confirmations is pretty ironclad. And, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, even after one confirmation, uh, if it's a fairly low value transaction, you're pretty safe. And if you're delivering a digital good or if you're shipping something, the six confirmations may not be an issue because you don't ship it within yeah. an hour. Yeah. But, but um, if it's a d digital good that isn't gonna cost you much, if somebody you know, does do a double spend, then don't worry about it, just yeah. go yeah. ahead. Yeah, for a SaaS model, we have no concern, right? We're just upgrading people to a pro account. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't confirm, we'll on pro account, them, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. Say mean know, things there's, to there's them. No, there's, no, there's no risk. I'm going to yeah. send you a nasty email. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and the other thing that you have to sort of consider when looking at these, these risks is the risk of uh, a chargeback from PayPal is really high in comparison to the risk of a double spend with, uh, with Bitcoins. Yeah, yeah. You know, Bitcoin is the most counterf counterfeit proof form of payment right. that has ever been created. So. When you look at it, you know, the risks of Bitcoin payments compared to other forms of payment, it's astonishingly uh, Right. We, low. we use the terms unlikely or infinitesimally unlikely and when in, in talking about these things. And it's just really difficult to, to you know, put the points of a percent um, on, on these numbers. So I, I work for an online company and uh, uh, PCI compliance, although I have to say that I don't really know about this, this field, but uh, I know that PCI compliance is extremely important. And I'm wondering how Bitcoin payments fits into that or how so it affects that. PCI uh, compliance is, uh, could you give a, what's that acronym stand for? I don't know. It has to do with credit cards and Payment security. cards industry. Yeah. 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 Payment card industry. Yeah. Payment cards industry. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you don't, you don't, you don't need uh, compliance with PCI if you are using Bitcoins because it's not a card scheme. Yeah. Uh, you're not storing uh, the bank information of the customer. In fact, it's the merchant that's exposing his, his or her address but the customer is not revealing anything about his bank information. That's the, one of the big advantages of a Bitcoin payment. So you don't, you don't have the uh, certification cost and uh, compliance cost associated with storing uh, card numbers in your online shop. And, and if you don't, the problem is people have to enter their number each time they shop with you, which is uh, very cumbersome and will lead to high uh, card abandonment rate, whereas with Bitcoin, it's instant one-click payment. So I have a follow-up to that in that um, uh, Coinbase now has a subscription service, and, uh, and that involves uh, um, 
more something more along the long line. Credit cards where you tell uh, Coinbase that you want their customer to pay you money, and you have to have their account numbers and things like that. So maybe it does apply in some way. I'm just wondering if you guys have any idea um, how that would relate. Coinbase. Yeah, I mean, you're adding back in uh, the, the pull nature of the transaction. Right. So, uh, I, I love your question about PCI, by the way. We talk about that all the time. The, uh, one of the things I do love about Bitcoin is that uh, if somebody, if you don't do your job in securing your servers and somebody breaks into it, it's your money that is getting stolen um, due to your, you know, in incompetence. It's not your customer's data, which is mm -hmm. the way it should be. Um, but getting back to the, um, you know, subscription payments, um, there, there is a way to do it over the open Bitcoin protocol. And instead of actually doing a pull transaction, what you do is you pre-authorize push transactions. And I think that's, that's the way to do it the right way. And, and you, you still have that authorization of that push transaction. You haven't compromised anybody's account or given anybody the authority to pull any funds without your consent out of your account. And so there'd no, be no need for it. There'd be no compliance around that you know, that would be necessary. Right. Thank you. Yeah, at this point, uh, you know, the, the world of compliance is, is very fluid in Bitcoins. You know, maybe the government will try to, you know, put some kind of regulations on them or whatever. But, uh, you know, it's only recently that, that they're even talking about that it'd be, you know, the government talking about Bitcoin actually being a currency. If you would, sir. So I guess this question's uh, for Christian mostly. Um, have you considered uh, offering, uh, and maybe you already do, and I, I have not used Foodler in the past, but uh, so apologies if I'm asking something that doesn't make any sure. sense, but have you considered offering discounts since the merchants are saving on credit card transaction fees and you're saving on uh, uh, processing chargebacks and the effort required and saying, hey, if you pay with Bitcoin, it's 1% less and or 2% less and split 1% with the merchant that's accepting Bitcoin. So they've got an incentive to push it, mm -hmm. you know, when people visit the establishment and then uh, later on, they want to order the food online via mm -hmm. Foodler. Um, and then, you know, everybody wins and encourages Bitcoin adoption and all that. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, so first off, we don't charge any fees above the, uh, the Mt. Gox exchange rate at the time that the deposit is received. Um, and we would absolutely love to offer a discount. You know, the way I see it, that the existing um, fee structure that occurs with the tr traditional networks uh, is, uh, can be passed back right back to the consumer. Um, we're just getting started, so we haven't done that yet, but we do reimburse the transaction fee, which is a small start. But we'd love to offer, you know, in the form of Foodler in particular has points uh, that we use as an incentive program, so we'd love to offer additional points to our consumers. We'll probably do something like that in the coming weeks, uh, because you're right, it is, uh, it is beneficial to us, and we ought to pass it back. Yeah, and I, I can speak to that as well. We actually do currently offer a discount for anybody that signs up to Engine.co with Bitcoin. Instead of being $9.99 a month, it's $8.99 a month, right? Or instead of $120 a year, you know, it's uh, $99 a year. So we're actually pretty aggressive in offering a 10, 20% discount. It's processing fees. We also are really into and part of the Bitcoin community. Right, we've been longtime Bitcoiners, so we want to see and drive that adoption. And a Bitcoin early adopter is adopter that's likely to tell other people about programs that they're using. So, from the perspective of a high tech startup, I'll will I'm willing to pay that discount for Bitcoin people, and I I would offer that as a great strategy in general for merchants that are offering Bitcoin. Pass along the savings, offer a discount, give people an incentive. And we can really drive this cycle a lot faster than just, hey, the novelty of same price just in Bitcoin. There is a, there's a savings. Either they're split that or you know, give it all back to the consumer. But I think that's, that's a great strategy. Yeah, Here, did you have especially something? with the recent credit okay. card law changes that now allow you to charge extra for credit card charges. Yeah, in, in, in my business, I find that I want the Bitcoin so badly that I, it's a negotiation in, in putting together sort of radio ads and um, the process can go on for a little while. I know with Bitcoins, I'm going to get my payment right away. And I often find myself sort of discounting the, the rates just for that purpose. I think that happens a lot. Uh, so back to the confirmations uh, conversation we were having earlier. Um, I was wondering, I think you said there might have been a paper on it or, or, or not, but uh, 
Uh, I was wondering if there's a good way to assess the risk level of each confirmation of how much processing power or how much cost it would have for that person to create fraud on it. So, you know, a cup of coffee is probably fine at zero or one confirmation, but how, do we know the levels of which, you know, what's one, what's two, what's three, you know, what, where the risk level is? Yeah, you should read that paper by Minnie Rosenfeld. It, it really goes into the mathematics of that and really in detail. And he has a summary at the very end where he talks about the value of your transaction and what's, you know, what's your confidence level that there won't be a double spend. Okay. And then I had another question, um, and that's with your business at BitPay, uh, you do things a little bit, I guess, backwards in protection compared to the normal credit card system as far as consumers are really protected when with, you know, credit card fraud and whatnot. How do you vet your, uh, your businesses that come on board to make sure that they're not going to, you know, fraudulently collect a bunch of money and then not send products to people. Yeah, that's a really, that's a big challenge for us. Um, and we're working through those processes right now and trying to hone them and define them. But essentially, if a merchant is doing more than a certain amount of volume through us, we require that BitPay knows who they are. Uh, essentially, and we collect documentation and all, all of that sort of the thing. The merchant knows who the merchant is? That we know who that merchant is. Okay. That, that way, uh, if there is a problem, then you know who to go. Uh, sure. You know, sue. <laughs> Need or, heads on platters <laughs> here. Yeah, right. Um, and, and just knowing their identity will eliminate a lot of the, the fraud problem, but it doesn't eliminate all, right? And BitPay is careful about trying not to insert itself in between that buyer and merchant relationship. We work for the merchant. Um, but of course, if there is a merchant that we find out that is conducting fraud, then we shut them down immediately. Yeah. We don't freeze funds or anything. We can't. We sweep everything out every day. But, yeah. um, but we will stop doing business with somebody that's trying to commit fraud. But it's just it's a hard add, challenge, though. Yeah, yeah. But just to add somebody to your confirmation question, I think the paper you cited by many is really important. Um, one of the nice things that I understand about the Bitcoin network is as it grows, as it becomes stronger, the confirmations are, you know, not all equal, right? As the network becomes stronger, so we're more and more hash power, you know, involved, there are more and more nodes, the strength of each confirmation grows in a huge way, mm -hmm. right? The confirmation today, you know, one confirmation is much more powerful than it was two years ago when you had far fewer people involved in the system. And that's part of why it's really exciting to be able to do all these different things inside the blockchain, yeah. because we can leverage the power of all the processing that's going on on the main blockchain. That's right. And so security increases over time. Two years from now, one confirmation may very well be a huge deal compared to what it is today. And so that'll change over time. But I think it's interesting. It, it's really the use case. You know, you guys have a use case for instant and it's mm -hmm. lower cost stuff. Mm -hmm. You have a use case for longer term things and time's not as much of an issue. But just to, wanted to throw that in there. Security will improve over time as the network gets larger. Mm -hmm. I was uh, really interested in all the win-win scenarios uh, that the questions have uh, elicited and, and your responses to them and how you conduct business. I think it's really interesting. I worked overseas uh, for quite a bit doing microfinance, working on value chain uh, uh, projects where you know you work with dairy farmers and the microfinancing and the, the dairy that makes the cheese. And so it's kind of a cluster and, and wanting to make sure that each chain in, in the value chain has the necessary credit to uh, ship the product and it, this cluster formation happens. Uh, so with that said, and the concentration of Bitcoin use, let's say in San Jose versus the DC area, and that great video that came out a while ago about Berlin, um, can you give any examples where all along the value chain, you have the different inputs, you know, using Bitcoin along with the end uh, producer of whatever product X, and it might be a, along the spectrum with that. And if, if, if not, if you don't know how any examples, what could be some examples where a particular cluster could develop, whether it be a honey producer who makes caramel candy like uh, the gentleman I, I met today who provided stuff in the bag. So just wanted to present that to you as a question. I, I suppose the, the tech community is already an ecosystem where uh, Bitcoin is thriving because the people have the culture to understand the workings of Bitcoin. And, and that makes a very uh, powerful complementary currency for this ecosystem. But I guess David can testify to this. Sure. Uh, and that's, that's exactly the fact. And, and not only that, providing software as a service or a digital good, more and more I can buy everything I need to provide my service 
with Bitcoin. So give a specific example, right? We use servers to index data so that users can search and basically do personal data mining of all their email inboxes and calendars and contacts and things like that. I can now get servers, right? I can now rent servers with Bitcoin. Uh, increasingly, you can hire programmers that are interested. I've been approached by several programmers. We want to work for Bitcoin, right? So if I can pay my programmers, I can run my servers. You know, I don't know anywhere yet. I can buy electricity with Bitcoin, but if I'm renting servers, you know, they're getting electricity for somebody. So you end up, like you're saying, with this vertically integrated chain where everybody in that chain can accept uh, Bitcoin. But I, I think you're right. It'll be the tech industry where people are much more knowledgeable about this emerging technology than other industries will will lag behind. But we have a great use case where we can have. I think by the end of the year, you'll be in a situation where you can have a completely pure. Bitcoin economy within particular tech verticals. Yeah, I think there are strong network effects here. So it reminds me of um, the early days in the internet where it might be really exciting to see a company that had a website. Uh, as more and more companies have it, then their competitors will start offering it as a necessary response. Um, and, and I agree exactly that offering the service today is where we can do it pretty well. We actually advert we have a small advertisement that we pay with uh, Bitcoin. So um, it spans the spectrum of tech services. So um, you, you're saying that it's people are always comparing bitcoins to the internet, hmm. and do you th I mean, you know we're looking we're sitting back here, depending on when you decide the internet started for yourself. I mean, I, <laughs> I decided it started when I heard about it the first time, but I, I, apparently it was going on before that. Um, but, but, you know, so for me it's like 1993, uh -huh. and uh, you know they got wow you can go and you don't have to go to the library to look up uh, stuff and um, online to find out information. And still, it's a fascinating idea. Do you think that bitcoins are going to change the world as? radically as the internet has changed the world? Maybe Absolutely. more so. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's uh, I guess the reason we all bought these tickets for this place. <laughs> 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 it's a bunch of, bunch of true believers here. So Pierre, <laughs> um, there are business people who are sitting out in this audience right now. They're wondering um, about the challenges of taking Bitcoins. What do you have to say to that individual if they're in uh, Europe and um, you know, how can you help them? Um, well, first of all, they, the, the nice thing about Bitcoin, they can implement their own solution. They are not bound to any particular vendor or, or partner. They can uh, switch to an in-house in solution anytime. Uh, they, they, will, they know they will have competitive fees, uh, fee structure because uh, the day you are not competitive in this uh, Bitcoin field, you are, mm -hmm. you are out of the market by the very nature of the, the open source uh, nature of the, of the software. So that, that in itself is, is, uh, should be enough for, for a merchant to at least add it to the options, the payment options on, uh, uh, on their website. And in fact, we are working with a payment processor that's a traditional payment processor uh, in Europe uh, with uh, 10,000 merchants and they're they are just adding the Bitcoin payment option as, as an option to mm. the, the, the other traditional payment option so that alone also is gonna is gonna help uh, merchants make a decision because then they sign up with this payment processor and they can just check the box and, and have bitcoins as a, as a payment option. I mean, when I say Bitcoin, it's a payment, it's a Bitcoin wallet. It's not necessarily bitcoins as, as a currency. It's Bitcoin as a payment network. As Stephen said, uh, uh, all you need is a, um, is a Bitcoin wallet, in fact, to pay through this uh, kind of mechanism. Uh, David, somebody's hanging on, um, you know, sitting on the fence. They're kind of wondering whether or not they're going to take Bitcoins. Um, and, you know, you've been doing it in your business for quite some time. What's your advice to them? Well, I think probably the best advice is just dive in. Just get some Bitcoins. Just start using it. And I think that's really where people get comfortable is take it out of the, you know, conceptual, take it out of the theoretical and just download a wallet get ten, hundred dollars, a thousand dollars worth of bitcoins and get to know the ecosystem and quickly you'll get comfortable and once you get over that learning curve of oh I get how to send an address, receive an address, you know, encrypt this, do this securely, um, I, that's the best advice I can offer, right, is get involved, you know, set it up and you'll, you'll get that comfort level fairly quickly. Um, and I agree with he, what he's saying. It, it, it is really, from a company perspective, great that you're not locked into a particular vendor. Um, but it's also really helpful now that we have services where you don't have to do all that back-end work. For the less, let's say, less tech-savvy uh, of those offering the service, you know, that's a huge advantage. So I say just jump right in. 
Um, I think a lot of people are, you know, have been given the advice, get one Bitcoin. And I... I wonder about this advice because I, I kind of feel like the uh, the the, um, the the bookie the bookie saying, "Hey, just bet on one game," because Bitcoin's just so fascinating to to watch. I've got on my phone. I've got three different exchanges. I can watch it rise and fall. Um, oh my goodness, it's at 123.2 now. Yeah. And you know, I don't look at Facebook. I look at my Bitcoin exchanges and yeah. see what the numbers. Well, if you really going. care, if you really care about your family and friends, give them a little. Little bit of Bitcoin. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the hero here is is Roger. You know, for running the faucet and handing out. I think he handed out a total of ten thousand bitcoins over the early days. He did it and, on my radio show. Anybody who comes to the Facebook page, I'll give you a yeah. bitcoin back when I don't know what bitcoins were worth. But it was you know, so you we, would give you would give one away. We we can all do that uh, from an individual perspective today. There's now a Bitcoin app for Facebook. Download the app on Facebook. Put you know half a bitcoin in there, whatever you're comfortable with, and send people your bit bitcoins, and you know they'll get interested, and you can develop it through that. But that's a good method. Sir, sure. Um, I was just wondering how Fuller um, handled the bitcoins after it received them, whether they passed them off to the merchants or whether they converted them to USD before mm -hmm. passing them off. And if they do, if you do convert them. How do you deal with the uh, conversion risks that are involved as far as commission fees and possibly price movements um, in between doing the conversion? Mm -hmm. yeah, great question. Uh, we actually had someone ask us whether they could tip their drivers in Bitcoin. Uh, so as of right now, we don't have any restaurants on, sign, signed up on Foodler that will accept Bitcoin. So in, in order to pay them, we must convert uh, through an exchange. Uh, we do that periodically. You know, the currency risk exists, but it, just as it moves up, it also moves down. So, so far, we haven't seen any uh, problems with that. Uh, and as we, as we need to mitigate that risk, we can convert more rapidly. Yeah, I think it, I, to some extent it's kind of the, the risk of doing business. Maybe I'm a little more cavalier in the way we do it on, on my radio show, but I did take a purchase when on the, the run up. I don't know, we should have a name for this little spike that occurred and went up to 250 or whatever, but the big one. And um, I took a payment at like 150 um, when it was at, you know, compared to one, uh, $150 for one Bitcoin. And, you know, it went down to 60 shortly thereafter. We just honored the, of course we honored. I mean, you know, they, they bought at 150 and I honored the, the payment at that point. Um, obviously on radio, you're, you're selling people talking and airtime. So it's not the same as shipping a car out the door, but I, I think you just, I think you just do it. <laughs> Cause it, when it goes up, it goes down. And I had another customer pay at uh, 50 and it, you know, now it's worth 122, I said, or something like that. And so, you know, no, I didn't refund them anything either. So, yeah, that's kind of how it goes. Um, Stephen, the people that are out there wondering how do I take Bitcoins in my business? Um, some people can get away with just, you know, hanging out a, a wallet address out there and saying, yeah, send me Bitcoins and I'll send you a trinket or whatever it is that they do. What advice do you have for them? Uh, well, there's one simple way I can think of. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that's <laughs> certainly no, provide created, solutions in that arena. Yeah. So when we created BitPay, uh, our objective initially was to make it so that people get could start accepting bitcoins within five minutes. And you really can if you you have a very simple, uh, if you have simple needs, you can sign up with a merchant account and you can be accepting bitcoins within five minutes. So even less. What what about the people that are that you know the, the small time online merchants that maybe have a few transactions uh, a month mm -hmm. and they hang out a Bitcoin address out there? What do you? How are you stepping up your service from you know basically free? Um, you know what, what what do they get for whatever extra they they, they pay for for Bitcoin? Yeah, well somebody uh, just accepting one payment a month might want to just do that, just mm -hmm. put their address out there. Um, but I mean we deal with. Uh, all sorts of issues. Uh, a, a Bitcoin payment has uh, a lot more edge conditions than a credit card payment. You have partial payments, underpayment, people pay twice, they overpay. All those cases can generate refunds and uh, so you have to handle the refund process. Uh, Mt. Gox happens to have a, a bug in it where it's very easy to send a payment two or three or four times because their website isn't that responsive, and so people accidentally send us three or four or five payments, and then, <laughs> and then we have to refund that. I wish if I had a, a Bitcoin for every time I had to refund one of those, I would probably have all the Bitcoins. <laughs> <laughs> 
So this is uh, related to my previous question about being a 100% Bitcoin business. Um, this is an idea I came up with and perhaps something BitPay might uh, be interested in doing if you haven't already thought about it. Uh, so I was thinking of like bill pay uh, with um, banks where you line up all the you know, bills you have and you can authorize that you know, these all get paid on certain dates. Is something like that possible or will it, do you think it ever, ever be possible? It, it already exists. Okay. Uh, there's uh, one of our merchants, I believe it's Bitcoin Bill Pay. I have to look up that name. Okay. Um, they do, do exactly that and they charge 0%. And this is, you know, for those that uh, probably one of the most difficult parts of the Bitcoin world is getting in, you know, exchanging you at your U.S. dollars or euros or whatever for Bitcoins. And a lot of people are finding that the what they want to do is they want to do business to get Bitcoins. And that's what we're doing on my radio program, Free Talk Live, where, you know, we, it's not like we're converting these things to dollars. We're holding on to them. Um, and... This is, you know, this is a, this is what people want. How can I pay my electric bill in bitcoins? Somebody said, well, I'll put, I'll pay your electric bill for you. You give me the bitcoins. And these are, you know, for a lot of people who are thinking about how to start a business, I think that essentially inserting yourself between how some, you know, what a, a service that somebody has, uh, you know, is already paying for, wants to pay for, and they only accepts U.S. dollars, and then taking bitcoins and yeah. you know getting yourself in. Well, just like just to do. add to that, I don't think many people appreciate how quickly this is moving. By the end of the year, and you could even argue today, there is nothing short of taxes that you will not be able to pay with bitcoin. I mean, we've got in the audience to shout out to the Gift founder. They've launched a service where you can literally buy from any merchant, from Amazon to whoever you want, instantly get the code from the gift card and buy it online. So you've got a direct BCT to the entire existing retail industry. Right. So you, you can buy food, anything. You can get furniture. Yeah. <laughs> you can so get... we're, we're going to get to a point by the end of the year where you're literally going to be able to get, if we're not already there today, anything with Bitcoin. And that's a really, really exciting world. And, and you can actually also pay your taxes. There's a company called eGovLink that lets you do that. <laughs> but, but only All right, taxes. we're there right now. <laughs> Not U.S. government taxes. No, just it's some, only certain right. local jurisdictions. You can play your, pay your local mafia, the big one. <laughs> You're saying? Uh, as merchants and vendors, what do you want to see at the next Bitcoin conference from the development community? What new tools maybe to take advantage of the tricks that are in the blockchain and things like that? Just... Mm -hmm. From a business perspective, what's missing? Well, Gavin alluded to the payment protocol this morning in the Satoshi client. So that's a significant um, enhancement, I would say. Um, so, but maybe uh, that there are going to be other solutions, but that one is particularly interesting. And there are also people talking about uh, more advanced uh, concepts like uh, homomorphic payments. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, BitPay, you're familiar with this, but uh, or you want to implement this. But where, where as a buyer, you you basically generate the address based on the transaction context. You take the context on the transaction, so you pay through this address, and therefore um, you have uh, you don't have to share anything, any secret with the merchant, and yet you know you are paying the merchant for that transaction. There are lots of interesting mechanisms that can be built in the existing Bitcoin technology. Uh, and it's interesting the core team is working on it, and there are other people thinking about it. Uh, homomorphic payment is, a, I think, is a paper by some uh, German academics. Uh, so it's all over the place that people are thinking about ways to use the Bitcoin protocol as a, as a secure protocol. Because as, as evidently the weakness is when you have uh, 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 the opportunity to, to switch the address, the payment address, for, uh, as a man-in-the-middle attack or whatever attack you are subject to. So uh, there are ways to address this risk uh, in the Bitcoin technology. I've got a really big one. Um, Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, uh, I have a lot of interest in colored coins. If anybody is interested in colored coins, talk to me afterwards. But there's a real opportunity to use the existing blockchain for more than transactions. Uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, smart property. Anybody who wants to know more about this topic, just look up the YouTube video from the last Bitcoin conference in London. Mike Kern gave an incredible talk on this subject. Um, and I'm interested in pushing forward the implementation of colored coins. Basically, the idea, for anybody who hasn't looked at it, is I can take a Bitcoin, I can split it into a thousand fractions, I can add a little bit of metadata and say, okay, this is now one share in company X. 
and now I can send you one share in Company X from my wallet to your wallet. Uh, there was a proof of concept already done called Armory X, which basically lets you do this. Um, so the proof of concept is there, really just needs some leadership and some developers to spend more time on that. But Colored Coins is something I'm really excited about. Having built startups professionally for the last 10, 12 years, one of the biggest pain points is not being able to send, have a market for shares. Obviously, there's a lot of regulatory and compliance around that, but I think the first company that cracks that code, either just like BitPay or Coinbase have done in you know navigating the regulatory industry when it comes to transactions, the first company that really cracks that for stocks and bonds and other things with colored coin technology, I think that's gonna be extremely disruptive, so. I'd, I'd like to see uh, reputation-based systems built into the protocol. Uh, I think that'd be really interesting. It would open up all sorts of possibilities for everyone if we could know that this sender could be trusted uh, based on the uh, previous experiences. I was going to say um, deterministic fees uh, so that when your wallet, when you pay from your wallet, your wallet can determine how, how big the fee should be on that to have a s particular statistical chance of getting into a block within a certain time frame. Yeah, that, yeah that's great. That's being <laughs> talked by Gavin today he, he said that that was the main one of the main projects to, yeah. to, to do yeah but uh, when i i own a, a a college yes it's the one the only one that i know that accepts bitcoins but the problem is that when they pay us i, I can do my receipt with, with that i accepted bitcoins in exchange but the difficulty is for us i'm not in us yes i'm in argentina and the difficulty is to turn that again into into cash because it's usually in a non white market i mean there's or, or even exchanges don't don't extend recipes and for a company if i had an income in bitcoins or or a relative exchange price yes i have to also have an outcome and i mean that's missing in the generally in the the the, the, the official way of moving and showing bitcoins in the account in, in the counting, that's one of the things I, I think it's the worst thing for, for a main, mainstream uh, at business adoptance, no? Mm -hmm. What do you think? No, I, I agree, one of the things w we do is every transaction has an exchange rate attached to it so that we can generate the, you know, the dollar equivalent value so that even if a company is keeping bitcoins for their accounting purposes, they know exactly what the dollar value of those bitcoins was for every single transaction. So that helps. Anyone going after ADP? Payroll and Bitcoin? Payroll processing services? Payroll is an interesting area to get into because uh, uh, Bitcoin is a great way to pay people internationally and international payroll is a real painful experience for a lot of companies. We, we do get asked for that all the time. But then you have to, then you really do have to pay attention to the regulations. Yeah, the regulation, at least in Europe, it tells you to pay your, your employees by wire, by bank wire. So it's not an option from, from what I know in Europe, it's not an option yet. Oh, well, that is Maybe you can pay a bonus or something, a, a bonus perhaps, but not the base salary. A, a lot of people pay foreign employees by loading up prepaid debit cards and they pay sometimes 20% for doing that. It's really a problem. Yeah, I would think there might be a solution for foreign employees. In the United States, I think one of, you, know, you can really do anything you want until you get sued, in which case all the regulations then pile in on your head, <laughs> the ones that you never had any idea that they existed. Well, no one told me about that, and so what? You're, you're going to jail, or whatever it is that uh, the, you know, the, the punishment is. So it's, I sincerely hope somebody makes some solutions for paying uh, employees <laughs> in bitcoins. <laughs> I would uh, love so to see as, that. As Stephen said, perhaps for a freelancer overseas, it's mm -hmm. possible, but for a domestic uh, operation, I don't think it's an option yet. That's, that's all I can say. So payroll, uh, payrolling in uh, bitcoins, at least in Europe, I cannot imagine. Uh, the reason is pretty simple. Uh, you have a legal commitment to pay a certain amount of, say, euros, per month, and as long as the Bitcoin is increasing, this will go up, there's no problem, 
but once Bitcoin would go down, uh, you have the whole uh, process, uh, the whole uh, legal law speed. So. And uh, even uh, for um, freelance, I have my doubts uh, because you are, at least in, let's say, uh, Latin law, you are forced, uh, you will get what they call an exequatur. So the, when you have an enforcement to be done, it will be transformed in euros, and from there on it will go on as business as usual. So you can write what you want, but at the end it will not necessarily be done the way you've, you've committed to do. Thank you, everybody, for coming and all the great questions. And um, you know, thanks to my speakers. Everybody, thanks for coming. Thank you.